social entrepreneurs. Three minutes. Your vote, $20,000. Welcome to Future Fund 10 Live. So uh, what are we here for? Well, Hilda, over the last six months, the Future Fund has culled through almost 60 nonprofit applications and selected these 10 nonprofits that are here tonight. We recruited over 30 community volunteer coaches in all stages of life and career who have rallied around each finalist to help them hone their pitches while also incorporating advice from professionals. Each finalist has gone through hours of coaching sessions with enthusiasm and strength. Everyone will walk away with additional tools, confidence, community visibility, and hey, they might even walk away with $20,000. Wait, so what is Future Fund? <laughs> Future Fund is a core initiative of the Community Foundation, which is a trusted partner for impacting Greensboro in a positive way. The Future Fund is celebrating its 20th anniversary with the goal of allowing young people to give a little and impact a lot. Over the years, young professionals have pooled their funds, adding to the now $1.3 million Ann Lineweaver Endowment Fund. Word on the street is Ann is here tonight? She is here tonight. Ann, where are you sitting? Future Fund is driven by young professionals who volunteer to serve on our planning committees. Wait, Carrie, you don't work for the Future Fund? I thought you were up here with me because you work for Future Fund. <laughs> I'm a commercial real estate broker with Brown Investment Properties, and I help en entrepreneurs find their space in Greensboro. What about you? I promote renewable energy with Green State Power, but I've been involved with Future Fund for over eight years now because my parents instilled in me both an obligation and a true joy in giving back. Everyone in this room has a why they contribute. What is yours? Is it serving as a coach, becoming a sponsor, or volunteering time on one of our committees? We invite you to not just look at yourself as an audience, but as an advocate. Everyone that contributes is a philanthropist. So you're saying I'm a philanthropist? Aren't you a future funder? Yeah. <laughs> well, you may not be Bill Gates or Oprah, but you're a philanthropist. As a philanthropist, I'd like to tell you that Future Fund is about engaging and lifting up com our community. So I'd like to ask you to please stand up, literally. <laughs> On the count of three, turn to the person next to you, make meaningful eye contact, and say, I'm a philanthropist, and I'm happy you're here. One, One two, two, three. <laughs> I'm a philanthropist, and I'm happy you're here. That was amazing. The energy is contagious. Now sit back down. We got 10 pitches to go through. <laughs> Inspiring giving, strengthening communities is the mission of the Community Foundation. We are living that mission tonight. Some of us might care about a particular finalist. Some of us might be here to support Future Fund. But we're all here because we love Greensboro. The Future, future Fund, Fund is, is about the future, future of, of Greensboro. Greensboro. <laughs> tonight, to host these inaugural festivities, we have a familiar face and perhaps an even more familiar voice. Alec McAllister is a page pirate and graduate of Davidson College. After college, she became the voice of Davidson Wildcats men's basketball team, and you may recognize his announcing voice from many NCAA tournament games. 
In his day job, he's a partner in Tyler Redhead and McAllister Real Estate. And tonight, we are merging his worlds both as a voice and as a lover of all things Greensboro. Please help us welcome our MC, Alec McAllister. Hey, does this microphone work? Sounds like it does. They were a little concerned backstage, but I got a voice that'll carry. It's okay. I'm excited to be here. I want to start off with a little story. This is 1978, December-ish. I'm nine years old. It's that time of year when you're trying to figure out what do you give the loved ones. My dad is pretty easy. No lie, pencils and Snickers always carry the day with dad, always. That's all you got to do. Mom's a little bit more difficult, well, not because she's difficult, it's just she's mom. So I don't know what to get her. I'm watching TV. I happen to be watching the Brady Bunch. Not that Brady Bunch, but a different Brady Bunch. Y'all have seen it. And a commercial comes on. It's, it's almost like this early infomercial-esque thing. And my eyes get real wide. This is it, right? This commercial is like selling me what I need, what my mom needs to make our life better. Let me just stop you before you go too far. I did not buy her a thigh master. That would be completely, <laughs> completely inappropriate. What I saw was this product from this company called Ronco. Y'all heard of Ronco before? They had me from hello, right? This little device, it looked like a, like a candle holder, right? But this candle holder looking thing, I mean, it was made out of like plastanium or something, right? I mean, it was futuristic kind of material. And in the middle of the holder, there's this needle real thin looking needle like looks like stainless steel today right but the needle came from Saturn no lie it was Saturn and Mars I don't know but this thing was outer space wicked good so what you do with this product is you're in the kitchen you set it on the counter you go to the refrigerator you get out your carton of eggs right you take out one egg and you very gently you set that egg right on top of that little candle holder thing you you pierce the egg with the with the Saturn needle and then you press down real gently and then inside the egg that needle just starts spinning around right it's whirring around and it is mixing the guts of the egg inside the egg shell now this was the Ronco 2000 inside the egg beater and y'all, life-changing, swear to God, is supposed to cut your egg cooking time from 10 seconds to 5 seconds. No lie. No lie. So I save up $12.89. I go to Eckerd's. I buy it, wrap it up. Christmas Day. It was not life-changing. I, I do not remember it being life-changing. I'm sure I got hugs and kisses but I don't think it was life-changing. So the reason for that story is, tonight, you heard a little bit from Carrie and Hilda. You're going to see 10 commercials, 10 presentations, 10 pitches from nonprofit organizations, and y'all, they're life-changing. What these folks do is life-changing. The best part about this Y'all being here with us, over 350 people, by the way. Standing room only, by the way, first inaugural. So congratulations. <laughs> Y'all heard this from Carrie and Hilda as well. You're going to award $20,000 to the best pitch.
pitch. You're going to judge it on a few categories. You're going to judge it best pitch. You're going to judge it on impact. You're going to judge it on innovation. You can judge it because they look good. It's up to y'all. Y'all are going to judge it. Don't worry about it now. We'll get into how we vote later for some of the technologically disadvantaged people in the crowd. We have actual ballots in your program. You can fill out a paper ballot. For others, you'll be able to use your phone and actually text in your vote by phone. But it's not just the 20,000. Let's take a second and let's go through all these prizes. So y'all will award $20,000, right? To the best, whatever you want to call it. You get the vote. The judges that we'll bring out in a second, we've got three celebrity judges, Greensboro Ties. They're going to get to award two different prizes. They're going to award a $12,000 prize. They're going to award a $7,000 prize, right? The coaches that you heard, Carrie and Hilda again, coaches have been working with these presenters now for several months, trying to hone that pitch, get them comfortable, get them ready, try and win 20 grand. Those coaches are going to get to vote, and they will award a prize of $2,000. And then right now, on Future Fund Greensboro Facebook live stream anybody out there watching hey y'all get to award a prize the community prize that's fifteen hundred dollars that is forty two thousand five hundred dollars let's hear a round of applause for that <laughs> now like any good infomercialist I would be remiss to not tell you that Ronco didn't stop with the inside the egg beater. They sweetened the deal. Now, I was, I was sold. I was gone. They won. That's the prize. But I got an ergonomic spatula <laughs> that could take paint off your house. You could shovel a driveway with it, or you could flip burgers, you can scramble your eggs. You can do whatever you want, right? So that that's it. That's over the top. So let's over the top this prize money a little bit. One more thing. I want you to look in your programs. If you see a bright green card with either $50 or $100 on it, you get to award that after the program to the nonprofit of your choice. So they're going to be in the mezzanine area. You will award that. They'll turn it in. Future Fund is going to reimburse for that kind of money. Okay? All right. That's the over the top. So here's what we're going to do. You've heard the basics of it. There were 56, I think over 56 applicants when they put this out, 56 plus applicants. They've narrowed it down to those 10 finalists. You're going to hear from each of the 10. They're going to give roughly a three-minute presentation, tell you about their organization and why they might be deserving of your support. We're going to get to hear from the judges. We'll hear some feedback, what the judges think about that pitch. Remember, too, this is not just about that money. That money's big and that money's great. But for these guys that have been working so hard on these presentations, they will use this every day. The next time they're on the street talking to somebody about their organization, they will have more confidence in making that presentation. So it's not just the money. These presentations are important too. All right. Here's the, here's the deal with the money. I need everybody to pull out $1,000 to come up with four. I'm just kidding. It's not. It's not. <laughs> we've already got the money. Okay, the money, and Carrie and Hilda tell you, comes from the $1.3 million endowment of the Future Fund. For 20 years, the Future Fund has been building that endowment. Let's have a round of applause for that. $1.3 million in that endowment. So what that doesn't pay for is everything else it takes to run an event like this. This space, the food, the beverages, 
the organization, the MC. I don't think I get paid for this. We'll take that, take that off. Everything else, the sponsors, our sponsors are who are responsible for that. So let's go through real quick. We'd like to recognize our sponsors. First, Catalyst and presenting sponsor, Brady Services, who stepped up day one to ensure we could pull this off. Could you stand, Brady Services, and let's give you a round of applause. The Brady Bunch. All right, next, our impact sponsor, Extraordinary Inc., the dynamic, dynamic duo of Rich and Sarah Schlentz. Stand up, please. So you need to understand about these guys. These guys have actually been coaching the coaches and the presenters, working with them for several months. Impact is the right word for what you've done. Fantastic. All right, next, our innovation sponsors, Deus Ex and the Greensboro JCs. And then our contributing sponsors, Charles Aris and the Triad Business Journal. All right. Please check out the rest of our generous sponsors listed in your program. All sponsors are wearing a yellow flag on their name tag, so when you see them after the show, now thank them, because that's why this happened, right? All right, judges, let's move on to judges. So we said we're gonna have three judges. Let's meet our judges. First off, Grammy Award winning producer who has lived in all the big music cities but decided to return to Greensboro to start the music revolution here. He's also the founder of culturepushers.org that caters to the underserved musicians and artists in the community. Please welcome Andreo Fanatic Hurd. All right, second, another Greensboro native with music in her veins. She plays violin with the hit band Mipso, and you will hear her play later tonight. Please welcome Libby Rodenbow. All right, and finally, this is a lifetime future funder, by the way. We'll go there, too. For those of you that don't know what a lifetime future funder is, you will, because you'll be one by the end of this night. All right, she's a lifetime future funder. Denise Turner Roth was city manager of Greensboro before President Obama appointed her head of the U.S. General Services Administration. There, she was responsible for over 12,000 employees and a $27-plus billion budget. She now serves as the chief development officer for the U.S. region of WSP, a global engineering and professional services organization. Please join me in welcoming Denise. Okay, so we're almost there. I know you've, you've, you've had enough of me, that's fine. I'll be back. So here's a quick recap. One by one, we're gonna bring these guys out. They are going to present to you. We're going we're to get to listen to what the judges have to say. Remember, the judges have their own vote, $19,000 they are awarding. So we'll listen to what the judges have to say. We'll walk off stage. Next presenter comes on. Good so far? In your program, you've got two things. In the back of the program, the very back page, that page, you can take notes. Notes are only important if you, you know, you have trouble remembering who's who. And with 10 of them, it can be a little challenging. You take notes. We would suggest your voting is around impact, innovation, the overall pitch. But it's up to you. Just take notes. Because at the end of all of these, again, y'all are going to award the $20,000 grand prize. So take notes. 
I think that's it. Are there any questions from the crowd? Are y'all good? All right. Welcome to Future Fund 10 Live. Check, check. Oh, it works. Hello. When I was eight years old, Samantha and I were coloring by a dirt soccer field in Ecuador. I colored a cat, but she colored a world where every child was eating. Samantha was hungry nearly every day. I was one angry eight-year-old, y'all. That is so unfortunate. Hunger is the easiest thing to solve in the world. All you have to do is make food affordable and accessible. Immediately, I went home and decided to be a part of the solution. By 12, I was taking flying lessons with a dream of flying food to people who needed, needed it the most. Later, I helped organize United Nations World Hunger Summits and implement school nutrition programs in Africa. When I came to North Carolina for school, I accidentally fell in love with the cutest guy and just had to marry him, and he brought me to Greensboro. For the first time in my life, I was really worried. What was I going to do here? Two weeks later, Greensboro was named the hungriest city in the United States. That bears repeating. Greensboro was named the hungriest city in the United States. Suddenly, I was home. I began talking to everyone I could about hunger. Where were the gaps? What were our strengths? Two things became very clear. The local food banks did not have the capacity to meet the need. And there was no real strategy to end hunger long term. 67% um, of students in Greensboro at the time were food insecure. Let's imagine for a second that we are the students of Guilford County. You here on the sides are he healthy, well-nourished, you have curious minds, you're excited about going to school and growing like a weed. Everyone sitting in the middle is hungry. You fall asleep in class. You have behavior issues because when your stomach is rumbling, you can't deal with the stresses of the day. That's what we were dealing with as a community. A simple gesture was born out of the idea that Greensboro is one of the most giving, generous cities in the country. We began giving our neighbors green bags, grocery shopping bags, with a list of items that the local food banks needed the most and a list of dates. We asked that every time somebody go to the grocery store, they just pick up one extra item, put it in their bag, and on the designated day, leave it on their front porch or take it to work. Today, over 4,500 people give at their home or work. And a local, and a, one of our 600 volunteers goes around their neighborhoods and around the city, picks up the bags, and delivers it to one of 11 local food banks, places like Backpack Beginnings, Out of the Garden, Guilford Food Pantry, and several others. We've collaborated and put a food pan pantry or a backpack program into every school in Guilford County. Tonight, I would like to ask you to sign up for a bag if you haven't already. These funds tonight are really going to help us uh, provide food to children zero to five. There are no programs right now, now to help feed those children, um, and we want to make sure that happens. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, guys, what do you think? <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Yep, there we are. You know what I love about this is how simple the solution is, right? And that it leverages all the activity that's already happening in this community. Sometimes it just takes that simple step to build a bridge. Thank you for what you're doing. That's just beautiful. <laughs> 
Now, I've lived in New York and L.A., and I've seen poverty at a mass level, so I know poverty here is not something that we can't conquer if we all come together to do it. Our organization, the Culture Pushers, are working with the United Way to end local poverty, so this resonates with me, and I know exactly what you're talking about. You're speaking my language, so I appreciate your efforts, and I think we can do this. Um, I was going to echo the thought that uh, you're very aptly named. It is <laughs> such a simple gesture. It's really elegant the way that you're integrating that, that gesture into people's everyday life. Everybody's going to be going to the grocery store. It's so doable, and I really, really appreciate that. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, judges. I'm not homeless, but I could have been homeless. I'm Scott Jones. I'm the executive board chair for Tiny House Community Development. I was raised right here in Guilford County with um, amongst the many of you. By a single mother who struggled every day, worked extremely hard to provide for me and my brother just so we could have the simple things in life like shelter over our heads and food and a way to school. It's 2019. There are about 350 people in this room, but right here in Guilford County, there's, there's over 1,000 individuals that are experiencing homeless tonight. So when you leave here, it's going to feel good to go home to a place that you feel safe and secure. But for many in Guilford County, adults and children, our veterans, our elders, who don't have a place to call home. They go, they live in cars or shelters or vacant buildings or houses trying to find a place to lay their head each and every night. Tiny Houses Community Development believes in more than providing safe, secure housing for people who are experiencing homelessness. It believes in providing the keys to success, opportunities, creating opportunities for individuals who have experienced homelessness. I'm excited to say that in May, we're going to start a new workforce development training program right here in Guilford County that's going to focus on taking individuals through a partnership with a local nonprofit, training those individuals, giving them a certification in construction like no other. They will also get the classroom, but they will also get the hands-on experience and the certification that will enable them to go out in the community and work for possibly many of you as maintenance personnel for apartments or industries, or even maybe they're contract contractors. They may decide that they want to advance their education, go back to our community colleges, get a degree. Maybe they get a license and they're able to start a job of their own, a company, and be productive and give back what they received through our program. Tonight, we invite you to be a part of our Tiny House family, an advocate and supporter of Tiny Houses Community Development. Tonight, we ask you to be a Tiny House family member. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that homelessness is one of those things that people like me who've never experienced it have a lot of trouble knowing how to contend with. I really like that your organization is facing that problem from so many different angles. I think that people who give to your organization will feel like their dollars are well spent. 
uh, being in the music space, uh, a lot of my colleagues that are in music and starving artists end up on the street chasing their dreams. So I, this resonates with me a lot. Um, I think tiny houses is such a cool concept as well. Uh, were you guys able to uh, contribute to the tornado uh, relief that, that happened out here um, uh, last year? We're working with the city right now to work on a program where we can build some small homes for people who are homeless oh, nice. from the tornadoes. Nice, nice. So you've heard the expression, teach a man to fish, right? And I, I, I think some of you may have read my story, but my family's life was changed because of a program just like yours, in which my mother became a bank teller, and that changed her life. And that took us out of poverty. Thank you for what you're doing. I'm excited for what you're doing. Thank you, judges. Thank you, judges. John was five years old. He did not talk and had an abundance of energy. I was his preschool teacher and would learn he had been removed from a bad home situation and had already bounced between countless foster homes. I am proud to say that I have now been John's mom for 35 years. <laughs> John will tell you that he's missing a little piece of his 18th chromosome and that he has just a tad of autism. He'll never drive a car or live alone, but the thing that breaks John's heart the most is that he'll never get to marry his girlfriend Erin, his cupcake, and that breaks my heart too. I am the executive director of Family Support Network. At FSN, we provide support, education, and caring connections to the family members of infants and children with special needs. There are over 4,000 children with disabilities in Guilford County, and most of them have a brother or sister. For 17 years, FSN ran a successful support program for siblings, where every month, over 30 children came together for support, learning, and fun. Unfortunately, due to funding and capacity issues, FSN had to close that program in 2014. Why support siblings? The life expectancy of individuals with developmental disabilities has doubled in recent years. My husband and I, we wish we could care for John for the rest of his life. But realistically, that responsibility will rest on the shoulders of John's three brothers. So it is imperative that we begin to equip kids with the tools to advocate, to understand, and to cope from an early age. As you can tell from the shade of my hair, this is not my first rodeo. <laughs> But of all the hats I've worn, working with the siblings has been some of the most touching work I've done. These kids are typically more compassionate and mature than their peers. But alongside that, they face other big emotions, including fear, embarrassment, guilt, and a need to be perfect. Not wanting to add any additional stress to their parents' lives, they often stuff their emotions and their questions Questions like, did I cause her seizure? Or how do I deal with feeling like I'm invisible? As they come together and share their stories, their faces come to life when they discover that happens to someone else too. With help from the Future Fund, FSN will develop a strong and innovative program for siblings by bringing in peer mentors, counselors, and artists to help siblings express their emotions to share deep dialogue and create a safe space to learn skills that will last a lifetime. Do it for John and his brothers. They would tell you it's worth it. Thank you. Judges. Wow, what a unique space you're feeling. Thank you for that. I think that innovation is a key part of tonight. Thank you for seeing that. 
a very compelling pitch. Very, uh, I can tell you're very passionate about about this, and uh, it feels good to be in a place of purpose every day. So absolutely, I'm very, very fortunate. Yes. Yeah, I I bet I'm not alone uh, in this audience, in that I've rarely thought about the emotional burden of siblings of children with disabilities. Uh, so I think that's an amazing effort that you're doing. And without you, uh, who knows if that would be getting done. So thank you. Thank you so much. It was May 28th, 1985. It was about 75 degrees outside, a little breeze in the air. However, the atmosphere inside of a superior courtroom was not the same as a young mother stood guilty before two judges awaiting her judgment and sentencing. The earthly judge pronounced a five-year suspended sentence with probation, but the heavenly judge over all things declared her forgiven, restored, and chances at a new life. Thus the seed was planted. However, it would not blossom until some 20 years later as the Almond Connection, also known as TAC, whose vision is to see the stigma of criminal backgrounds lifted from the lives of men and women so that they can live fruitful lives as restored citizens. Our two-year program consists of three distinct stages. The first stage is the budding process. This is where a new foundation is laid, uh, new beginnings, and then there is the second stage, the blossoming process. This is where uh, some maturity is taking place. There's promising evidence of transformation. A change is taking place. And then the final stage, the bearing of fruit. This is the end result, uh, the after effect. It is the bearing of fruit. A 2018 report revealed that approximately 1,300 state incarcerated men and women and roughly 17,000 locally confined inmates are released into our beloved communities and neighborhoods on an annual basis. Because of their criminal backgrounds, they face many obstacles and challenges as they prepare to reintegrate back into society. With your generous gift of $20,000, we can acquire office space for operations and execute our mission, which is to provide access to housing, employment, healthcare services, and all of those vital services that are needed to ensure that uh, these men and women are constantly reaching their goals of becoming self-sufficient and productive. Oh, and by the way, the young woman that stood before those two judges, that was me. <laughs> that was me, I have blossomed. I continue to bear fruit, and I stand before you tonight asking for your support and your partnership as we impact the lives of men and women that uh, desire second chances. I believe in second chances. Thank you. I think I'll tell you one thing I'll take away from tonight, heavenly judge. I have never heard that phrase before, but amen. Thank you.
you know, sometimes God takes us through certain things so that we can reach back and help others in that same space that may be going through those same uh, trials and tribulations. So I applaud what you're doing, and um, I think it's great. Uh, rehabilitation is, is so important. You know, we're all one second away from being in that same situation, you know. Really, really inspiring story. Um, congratulations to you on your whole life. That's an incredible story. Um, I, yeah, I think it's totally nonsensical to stigmatize people that we want to be part of our society, and that's a one one step in a really troubled prison and justice system. Um, so I think it's really important work that you're doing. Thank you. nothing. Those were the words of one of my very first clients. The terror and the tears were still in her eyes after telling me her life story. You see, her husband had left her pregnant and alone with two toddlers, fleeing for his life. And he thought that the government would leave them to leave their lives in peace, but instead soldiers came to her house every single day and they beat her and they threatened the lives of her children. And so she did the only thing that she could think of. She strapped her three-year-old daughter to her back, she lifted her 18-month-old son into her arms, and she walked into the jungle at night with only the moon to guide her in hopes of finding safety at a refugee camp in the neighboring country. And you know what, she did it. She made it to that camp and she found her husband and I was in awe of what she had accomplished, what she had done to protect her children. And yet, she thought she was worthless. New Arrivals Institute specializes in providing educational and supportive services to refugees and immigrants. Many people think that learning English is the magic that's gonna ensure that someone is able to integrate and thrive, but there is so much more to self-sufficiency than just language. The services we offer, they're not, they're not glamorous, but they get at the root cause of why people struggle to succeed in our country. Over the years, we've developed numerous community partnerships with people like Cone Health and the City of Greensboro and GTCC, and in turn, that has turned us into a hub where refugees and immigrants can get served by multiple agencies. Last May, we learned that existing programs were not enough to keep five of our refugee children safe. When I got the call saying that there was a devastating fire involving one of our families, I was heartbroken. How could this have happened? And as I talked to the community and we processed this horror together, a question emerged. And that question was, how could they keep their children safe when they don't understand basic cultural orientation information Things like fire safety. <sighs> Cultural orientation, it is provided, but our residents don't have linguistically appropriate materials available to them in their homes. Now this is something that we can change. It's a change that can happen quickly, and we can do this. We have copies of cultural orientation books in 12 languages, and printing those books and distributing them, that will bring us closer to preventing another tragedy. But we as a community, Greensboro, we can do better than that. We're gonna take that information and we're gonna turn them into videos, one for each language. And that means if someone does not have a book or if they're illiterate, they still have this vital information. There are 30,000 people in Greensboro who are foreign born. And together, we can make sure that they have the tools and the information that they need to turn I am nothing into I am someone. Such an important mission right now. Uh, Greensboro is uh, becoming more and more diverse each day. So I think this is a, a great cause and a, a great mission for you guys.
Yeah, it's such a big problem, but such a concrete and fundamental thing that you're trying to do. That's really great focus. I'll just ditto what my partners have said here. Thank you for what you're doing and being so thoughtful. Good luck to you. It's like a part of me is missing that never existed. Last year, I created the hardest show of my career, Misconception, a dance production and panel discussion on infertility. Why would I create something so sad? Because it's my story and dance is how I heal. Throughout the process of creating Misconception, I remember why dance is so important to our community. You may not be able to relate to infertility, but you can relate to fear, doubt, hopelessness, feelings of worthlessness. Yet so many people find unhealthy ways to express themselves. Drugs, isolation, alcohol, that social media post, <laughs> or worst, suicide. Did you know one in five adults have a mental illness. That means 60 of you sitting here right now are dealing with a mental illness and 30 of you have been since you were 14 years old. But so many people don't seek help. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in people ages 10 to 34 years old. We need dance. I posed a question on Instagram. Why do you love dance? Kelly responded, dance literally saved my life. If it had not been for that knock on my door, I probably wouldn't have made it to the next day. So for me, dance is everything. At Royal Expressions Contemporary Ballet, our greatest value is happiness and health. You see, when you dance, you release endorphins, which are neurotransmitters that help you feel fun, relaxed, Comfort, power. It's like saying stress cannot live in a dancing body. <laughs> At Royal Expression, we create opportunities for you to dance it out, whether it's through our professional dance productions that interact with our audiences, or our school, which serves adults and children, or our outreach programs like Dancing Dreamers, our signature program that connects us with other nonprofits in our community and teaches children how to dare to dream using dance and journal writing. $20,000 would be a huge deal. That's equivalent to four of our dance productions or 454 scholarships for our school. We could expand our outreach programming to seven new sites serving up to 105 new children. I want you to do something for me. Raise your hand up high and close your eyes. Ball that hand into a fist. Pull it down to your chest. Now open your eyes, open your hand, open your hearts, and open your minds to dance that inspires Greensboro. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you know, dance rescues as well. I'll, I'll say that at one point in my life, I was a royal let. That not many people know what that is, but thank you for inspiring us all. I'm a big fan of creative expression, and when you can tie it to purpose and have a mission behind it, I think that's great. So I applaud you. Um, I really appreciated those specifics that you gave us to understand how $20,000 would really manifest <laughs> in, in your organization. That's really useful. Thank you. A family came to the doors of Gate City Legal Services desperate. We were the only place left. This family had recently re received a notice of removal hearing. They had to go to immigration court. 
This family had fled from a country that is currently in conflict with one of the most infamous terrorist organizations known around the world. This family had been directly targeted by this terrorist organization. The family members have specifically been targeted for death. The family members had also helped the US military directly fight this terrorist organization, yet they were marked for removal if they did not succeed at their immigration hearing. They were desperate and they didn't know what to do. We brought them in, we had extensive interviews, we tried to assess the situation and figure out why they had failed in every other step leading up to this process because the last step is when you are going before a judge in immigration court and they're told you're either to leave or you can stay and you are granted asylum. Uh, previously, people had tried to assist this family. Every step more complicated than the next. The case was a mess. Uh, it was a quick turnaround for us. We worked nightly, we worked overnight, 24 hours. We did everything that we could. We even had to go to Walmart a bunch of times to get more printer ink. Um, <laughs> Just like any government organization, immigration court, they like really big, thick explanations as to why human beings are in danger somewhere in the world, as if the nightly news doesn't broadcast into immigration court. After working diligently, we rushed down to immigration court, we presented the case, we did the best that we could, and finally, once and for all, this family was granted asylum. Thank you. Thank you. Gate City Legal Services, we provide affordable legal representation for people who fall wi within what's called the justice gap. The justice gap is where you fit in between people who do not qualify for indigent legal services such as the public defender or legal aid, and these cases cannot be taken on by legal aid because they do not re represent these specific cases, and also people who cannot afford a traditional private law firm. We try to service that income demographic with a sliding scale income-based legal representation. We take people's uh, household income and how many people live in that house, we take that into consideration and then we um, accept those cases. We refer out to the private bar if they do not qualify and we graciously take what legal aid and the public defenders and other attorneys in the private bar refer to us in order to help fulfill this justice gap. If Gate City Legal Services is chosen tonight, we'll be able to use the funds to pay for the extensive bills that we have that keep racking up. We can also um, hopefully present more cases uh, free at, at no cost for our client. Um, so thank you. I love what you guys are doing in the community. This, uh, there's a real need for that, and I um, appreciate your efforts. I'm the child of an attorney at a private firm and a former public defender, so I really understand that gap that you're talking about, and I'm really glad that you're working to fill it. You know, if you all are like me this evening, you're going to leave here knowing that you are very privileged, and we are privilege as a community to have people like yourself. Thank you for what you're doing. Well done. I can remember it like it was yesterday. Sitting at my graduation ceremony at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, and the commencement speaker telling us all, I want you to leave this graduation and be Renaissance men with a conscience cause. Those words always stuck with me. Crossroads, Pathways to Success Incorporated is my conscience cause. In 2009, my childhood best friend Arturo McKee and I started Crossroads with the aim and intent to equip high school males with the tools and resources that they may need to be successful in life after high school, whether it's through obtaining a job or going to college. High school is a very confusing time for many young people. While you're sitting there all day learning tons and tons of information on different subjects, you start to have questions. You start wondering, is this really gonna pay off in the future? What am I doing here? Is this, what is this? 
Since 2009, Crossroads has helped over 97 students get a job or get to college after high school, and we have a 100% college acceptance rate. <laughs> Growing up in Greensboro, Arturo and I had positive male role models in our fathers. They would tell us things such as the importance of making good grades, staying out of trouble, and making good decisions in life. And I can say, for the most part, we tried our best to follow those directions. <laughs> Crossroads is able to have students come since 2009 to Saturday workshops twice a month. At these workshops, we focus on skills that students may not learn at home or at school. Skills such as speech and communication, business and dining etiquette, financial literacy, college preparation and learning and understanding when to apply, what SAT score do you need or ACT score, what scholarship or financial aid information is out there for you. Those are all topics that we cover. In addition, we go on field trips around Greensboro. We visit local colleges so that students can speak with the faculty and students at that college, get a feel for the campus and eat lunch there just so it gives them experience of what it's like to be at college for a day. We also visit local businesses so students can learn how that business owner got to that position in life, what they can do to get there, as well as if there's any summer or after high school job opportunities. And lastly, we go on community service events around Greensboro, where we help people in need, or we do community cleanup projects. In 2012, a single mother came to Crossroads and told us about her son, Jeremiah. Jeremiah was having trouble at school. He didn't really care too much about his grades, and it was pretty much going down the tube. We told her that we could help him. After speaking with Jeremiah and his mother, we identified some areas where we could help and things that we can implement into our program. Topics such as how to set short-term and long-term goals. Knowing not to just do what the teacher tells you to do that day, but doing a little bit more. And also understanding that everything you do from this point in life is on a record. A record for future employers and colleges to see. What we began to see in Jeremiah over three years was growth. We saw a student who went from not caring about his future, just kind of floating, to a student who was heavily involved in the outcome of his future and making decisions to make sure it was going to be the way that he wanted it to be. We saw growth in Jeremiah. Growth is something that we try to instill in every student who comes to the door at Crossroads. Going forward, with your support, the Future Fund 10 grant will allow our program to expand from 15 to 25 students. We'll be able to visit not just two colleges a semester, but three or four, and visit colleges not just in Greensboro, but outside and surrounding areas. We'll also be able to have a more robust experience for the students in the program by incorporating technological aspects, such as, such as the ability for them to you know, participate in the program from their cell phone or their laptop that day. And we will also supply each student in the, in the program with school supplies at the beginning of each semester and we will also be able to pay for each senior's college um, application and other fees. At Crossroads, we're not just here to help students get ahead in life after high school. We're here to help build young productive members of society to contribute to Greensboro in a positive way. As for Jeremiah, he's currently a senior in college at, G at UNCG. Jeremiah spends two Saturdays out of the month coming to Crossroads and volunteering to help new students in the program. And he's also on our board. So with your support, it will help Crossroads tremendously by helping us continue what we've been doing since 2009, which is building and helping build young men in the community, by helping them go from young men to Renaissance men in front of your eyes. Thank you. I love it. I love how practical and hands-on it is, and I love seeing young men of color leading the way. Thank you for that. That's such a uh, very pivotal moment in a kid's life from high school to college, just making that decision and uh, having some guidance to see if college is even for them and just helping to figure it out. So I appreciate you doing that. I'm not too far out from college or high school for that matter myself. And uh, I think that it's, it's easier now maybe than ever for a person that age to feel aimless. It's such an uncertain landscape of employment that you're looking at. So I think people feeling that there's others invested in them is so pivotal. Thank you.
27 years ago, my parents immigrated to this country from Congo. And when they finally saved up enough money, in 2002, they opened up a small convenience store on the west side of Charlotte. And as a young child, I dreaded going there. 15 hour days, no pay, but free food. <laughs> there was always a group of individuals that would come to the store. To us, we labeled them as regulars. But to society, they were labeled as homeless. And a man we knew as Brother Love was a part of that group. Brother Love was a very special person to me. He spoke to me, joked with me, and even taught me chess. To him, that was life's greatest game. Brother Love was an uncle to me, and for him and the regulars, they enjoyed coming to the store because for them, it was a place of refuge, a place where two immigrants and their children saw them for who they were and not what they were. Because they knew once they left those doors, they were judged for what they were, homeless. In 2015, I found myself in Greensboro for the first time on a college visit to UNCG. Afterwards, my family and I went downtown, and that's where we saw firsthand the city's issues with homelessness. I told myself, if I get accepted here, I'm going to do something about it. Two years later, I founded Smell the Roses. Smell the Roses is a homeless outreach focused on getting to the root of the issue and providing a solution. Many people believe that housing is the key to solving homelessness, when in fact, it's not. A house is a physical need, but what about the emotional needs? The feeling of self-worth, confidence, the motivation to pursue dreams you thought you no longer could. A great example is Jack, a man with two college degrees who sacrificed his entire life to save his parents who were ill with cancer. Unfortunately, they passed, and Jack soon found himself broke and homeless in Greensboro. Jack allowed us to share his story with the community. And with sharing his story, a local small business decided to give him a chance and hired him as their head of marketing. Another example is Janine, a woman who became homeless due to an abusive relationship that left her with a missing front tooth. In and out of shelters for seven years. In just one month of meeting her, she was able to go through our program and get connected with a dentist that provided her with free dental care, restoring that confidence that was once taken from her and allowing her to finally look beyond her physical appearance and apply for jobs she eventually got. I can go on and on about the individuals we've impacted here in Greensboro, but the biggest impact we've made here tonight, we're currently able to help three to four people a month, but if we win Future Fund, that number will increase to nine to 10. That's roughly 36 people a year to 120. That's 120 of our homeless neighbors that will be seen for who they are and for what they are, humans. Oh man, that was, that was really good, man. Uh, um, your presentation was great, uh, your story was great. Um, homelessness is a big problem and a lot of times uh, we don't wanna really get to the basis of where it's really coming from and everybody has a story and as I said earlier, like we're all one decision or something happening to us that we could be in that same situation and so you never know. So appreciate you doing all that you can to help out. Yeah, I really appreciate you talking about the emotional burden of being homeless and the importance of having self-confidence. It's so easy for me to imagine that what the physical obstacles of not having a house or not having a job would be dwarfed by the feeling that society doesn't see you as part of it. Alec, y'all are making it hard on us tonight. This is, this is just incredible. You, you just got here. You just got to this community, and you're already making a difference, one person at a time. Thank you. Thank you. I saw the crisis in her eyes the moment I opened the door and in the way her five-year-old boy clung to her leg. They had fled devastating poverty and violence in Honduras and somehow endured hundreds of miles of dangerous terrain and threats and made it to the border. She had hoped for relief to seek asylum, 
but was separated from her child instead into two different deplorable detention facilities. After 50 days, they were conditionally released and reunited and came to Greensboro to stay with an acquaintance. And soon that young boy began having panic attacks and the man they were with began shaking him and hit the mother when she tried to intervene. They had no possessions, knew no one here. They contacted an attorney they had met at the border who told them there was a safe place they could go to for help, Faith Action International House. This is just one of over 3,000 stories from people from all over the world, from Vietnam and Syria to Niger and Scotland, of people who rang our doorbell over just the last year, and they're some of the most courageous, resilient people you will ever meet. They're not strangers to fear. They're neighbors to embrace. We're known amongst many community partners as the Ellis Island of Greensboro, a refuge from the storm, a home that restores dignity and hope. And within a few hours, we were able to provide them emergency help with food, shelter, clothing, uh, legal services, and much more, and a Faith Action ID card so she could reliably identify herself with schools, health centers, and law enforcement and feel like a part of our community. And that ID card program created by Faith Action in Greensboro has since expanded to 20 cities across the nation, from West Palm Beach, Florida, to Cincinnati, Ohio, and Hood River, Oregon. She sent us a text the other day saying, you all helped me. You extended your hand and your heart without knowing me or where I came from. You made the impossible possible for my child and I, and we won't forget it. And history shown when we show kindness to our newest neighbors in need. Many overcome significant challenges and go on to become some of the best officers, teachers, and artists that we'll ever see. And with ongoing support, that will be the future for that remarkable five-year-old boy. And in the meantime, detentions are on the rise and our newcomer community is living with great fear. With your investment of $20,000, we can ensure no immigrant family walks alone. All legal consultations for those who are detained will be paid for, as those with legal representation are 14 times more likely to be released. And for the families left behind, they'll have access to emergency support with rent and basic needs, ensuring no families left behind. Now more than ever, we need your help to ensure the next family who rings our doorbell knows they have a home and they have a community that is there to serve, love, and protect them. Thanks for listening and know that you too are always welcome at Faith Action. Thank you so much for your work. Um, that your organization does such holistic work in this cause. That's a really impressive list of services that you just rattled off for us. And I especially thought the ID program is so simple but so innovative. And congratulations on that being adopted across the country. Every time I think I got this thing narrowed down, it, it switches on me. <laughs> but. Um, uh, just your commitment shows that um, the compassion that exists in our community, which um, you know is like overwhelming. Just everybody is just really trying to do their part to make this a better place for all of us. So appreciate what you're doing for us. So. Ditto to that. And you know, when I was in D.C., I saw many times how Greensboro was influencing the nation, and Fe Faith Action Network was definitely one of those that people talked about and were curious about and I know came and visit you all to learn from. Thank you for what you're doing. Wow, right? Wow. Can we have a round of applause for all 10? Okay, so we're gonna bring them back out that's gonna help you as you tally your scorecard. I know that was a lot, right? It's tough, it's very tough to choose. We'll bring them back out and then I'm gonna walk you through some of the, the ways to vote, a couple different ways to vote, so don't stress about that. But let's start by bringing them out and then, and then again we can give them another round of applause because they were all incredible. 
First off, Leslie Isakoff with a simple gesture. <laughs> Scott Jones with Tiny Houses. <laughs> Nancy Mika, Family Support Network. Gina Beasley, The Almond Connection. <laughs> Leilani Routon, New Arrivals Institute. <laughs> Princess Johnson, Royal Expressions Contemporary Ballet. Daniel Carlson, Gate City Legal Services. <laughs> Gerard Truesdale, Crossroads, Pathways to Success. <laughs> McGuire Lubica, Smell the Roses. <laughs> and David Fricaro with Faith Action International. All right, take a good look. Big round of applause. They're all incredible. They're all life changers. And we'll send these guys off stage. And let me tell the crowd how to vote for you. Thank you, guys. OK, if you have a phone, you know, in the movies, you had to turn it off. Now you can turn it on, right? And remember, if this scares you, there's another way to vote. But those that want to try it this way, you are going to text the number of the nonprofit that you want to be the Brady Services People's Choice winner. And I'll give you the number. First of all, on that scorecard, if you see at the bottom, this is on the back of your program, you see text one, text two, text three. The number is listed beneath the nonprofit. Does everybody see that? Okay, so you're going to text either a 1 or a 2 or a, to this number, 336-750-6020. You only get to vote once. And if that doesn't work, you've got this ballot that was also in your program. Single sheet of paper. It's got all 10 nonprofits listed. You're just going to pick one. And then you're going to see, uh, do we have steering committee members scattered throughout? Guys, you'll see people walking around. If you've got a paper ballot that you'd like to turn in, or if you need a pen, Flag down one of these steering committee members. You want the phone number again to text for your choice. The phone number is Is everybody making progress on that?
Guys, I'll give you that number one more time. It seems like we still have people trying. So if you want to text to vote, that number is All right, while we have the house lights up, they're backstage calculating. We want to take a second to recognize a couple important groups that we have here tonight. First of all, the coaches. You heard them mentioned before. So each of the nonprofits was assigned three coaches, and they worked with them to help hone their pitch. So would the coaches please stand up? If you're in the audience, let's see those coaches. So folks, these coaches are community members just like you and me. They volunteered their time to help make those pitches amazing. I encourage you to talk to them about their experience as you consider getting involved in the Future Fund. Secondly, we want to recognize the future funders. So the Community Foundation's Future Fund Endowment has been in place for 20 years now. You already heard some of this. A lot of people have helped build and continue to build. That endowment now stands at $1.3 million. So if your name tag says member or lifetime member, will you please stand so we could rec recognize you? <laughs> and if you are not yet, a future funder, don't worry, we've made it very easy for you to get involved. For a $150 donation, you can become an annual member. Or for a one-time donation of $1,250, you can become a lifetime member. Being a future funder puts you right in the thick of things in helping promote and celebrate philanthropy in Greensboro. You can visit futurefundgso.org for more details. I've done the math for you. If you plan to live more than 8.3 years, <laughs> you might as well become a lifetime for 1250, right? So when you're thinking of it, just keep that in mind. Instead of paying 150 a year, you'll, you'll, it's like, you know, it's like a mortgage and then just go ahead and do it all now <laughs> and you're a member. All right, so we're going to wait for those ballots to be tabulated. While we do that, we're going to experience an amazing local talent again. Please welcome Libby Rodenbow back to the stage. Thank you. Well, I, uh, I do this kind of thing up on stage a lot, but... I was so glad that I didn't have to be in the role of those uh, people presenting their organizations to us tonight. They did an incredible job. I'm gonna do something a lot easier now and, and play some of my music.
Thank you. Thank you, thank you. That was in a weird tuning, so bear with me one moment here. I'm guessing it's gonna take him some time to deliberate, because that was a tough, tough call. But if I need to get off of here, somebody just yell at me.
people don't mind. I'm afraid Thank you. Well, I was hoping that it would work out. I'd play one more because I wanted to do one that you might actually know. And I had to write down the lyrics because I don't fully know it myself. I bet you'll know the chorus.
Thank you. Is this on? Yeah, how about that? Another round of applause for Libby. That was fantastic. Okay, so we're getting close. We're counting. It's a lot of votes. So we're going to take a second right now to recognize, again, our presenting sponsor, Brady Services, who've made this night possible. Please join me in welcoming Jim and Louise Brady, the first ever Future Fund Chairs. Thank you. Hey, thank, thank, thank you, everyone, and, and what a wonderful evening. And I got to tell you, uh, I've still got a stockpile of banjo minnows that I bass fish with. Anybody see a banjo minnow on, on TV? It was on Saturday morning. You know, it's just guaranteed to catch that big bass, but I've still got a stockpile of those. So I've been right there with you, pal. Uh, listen, thank you, everybody. Uh, and again, thank you to Ann for this catalytic idea. Uh, she came to us in, with Walker and Dabney Sanders in 1999. And I think Louise was pregnant. I was definitely pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> really pregnant. And came up with this idea. And we said, we've got so much going on in the world. And we've got our careers. And we've got a baby coming. And we've already got two. And we don't have time. But we made time. And it was the best thing we ever did. And so, again, one of the things that we said, Walker and I stood in the corner drinking a beer one day and said, hey, this thing will really be a success if we can look out in the audience and see many, many people, a lot more people uh, than we've never met and don't know. And we're here. So thank you. Thank you all. We, we'd particularly like to thank uh, the Future Fund committee members for uh, changing things up and, and, and kind of starting anew. In 1999, you might imagine uh, what was going on in Greensboro, North Carolina. We were losing our textile industry. Things were changing. Uh, we were looking for things that are going to be catalytic to change and invite young people into the world of giving and how they can be, uh, each and every one of them, make a little bit of difference in someone's lives. And so. That's really the whole idea of, of behind the concept, and I, ca I got to believe that, that you know, we, we're, we're having success, but we're also at a tipping point now. We heard about it tonight. We heard a lot of numbers. We heard about 1,000 homeless in Greensboro. We heard about, you know, 12,000 uh, folks that, that are, are need rehabilitation into our jobs and our communities. We heard about 60-plus percent of our kids going to school hungry. We heard a lot about how are we going to take – take young men and integrate them into a society, help them get into college and, and, and make a way for them and their family, and, and really create this inclusive and diverse community that we have, and we've got to be proud of that. So again, thank you for the presenters, you know, fantastic job. Thank you to the coaches. Uh, the coaches, I need a coach like that. I don't know who, I don't know who the coaches are. Uh, just sign me up for a coach. <laughs> But really, thank to each and every one of you. I think that great song was wrapped it up, Miss Rodenbo. Uh, you know, uh, y'all are all angels, and thanks for being angels, and God bless every one of you. Thank you. Well, I'm the sweeper in case he forgot something. Jim, that was great. <laughs> he didn't forget anything. <laughs> it's not true. Um, it has been a true joy for uh, me and Jim to launched the Future Fund along with the help of a lot of our friends that we twisted their arms and begged them to join us in this crazy endeavor, um, many of whom are here tonight. So um, it wasn't a two-man show. It was, it was a, a whole group that launched the Future Fund. And I can't tell you how proud we are to look out and see how it has evolved. And that has not come easily. I know it's been a lot of hard work for all of the volunteers. So I, too, want to reiterate our appreciation for the commitment. I mean, we're committed. We stay in touch. We stay involved. We try to do our part and um, just encourage everybody else to do the same because it's not necessarily just for the 25 to 45-year-olds because uh, we're way past that. Um, and so, you know, lifetime members, that's kind of how they kept us involved. They're like, what are we going to do with all these old people that have aged out? Um, but so we, we really um, appreciate everybody's um, efforts. And um, I know personally, hearing the 10 presentations tonight, there are 10 organizations that I want to personally 
um, commit to help. So it, it's just amazing what this event and how creative this event was for the steering committee to come up with. And, um, and the staff at the Community Foundation is fabulous um, that's helping the Future Fund. But coming up with this idea, it's current, it's exciting, and clearly it works. What do y'all think? I mean, it's... <laughs> so I know there's only going to be a couple of winners tonight. There's going to be the $20,000 winner, then the judges' winners, and then, you know, there's additional, the people voting um, that are not here with us. But I think all of these organizations have are going to be winners because many of us are probably going to reach out to them like me. So thank you all. Carrie, you're up. <laughs> thank you. All right, don't go anywhere. Nope. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> all right, Jim and Louise, as Ann mentioned, we couldn't do this without you. Um, in fact, the Future Fund wouldn't even exist without Louise's hard work recruiting those inaugural members and Jim making sure all of his friends committed. And then you stepped up in a big way to make this event happen in its inaugural year. Before we announce our Future Fund 10 Live winners, we wanted to announce something special for you. As our presenting sponsor and as founding members of the Future Fund, we are creating the Jim and Louise Brady Future Fund Leadership Award in your honor. <laughs> <laughs> Starting next year, this award will be given to the Future Fund member who showcases the most leadership over the course of the year. The Future Funder will receive a lifetime Future Fund status. <laughs> or if they are already a lifetime member, they can pick a nonprofit of their choice to receive $500. Thank you, thank you for everything you've done. I, I do not have an envelope that I can theatrically open. I've got a list that was just scribbled for me. It's perfect. <laughs> but, but I do have the winners. <laughs> so we're bringing them all back out. All right, so we're going to start with the community award. Again, these are these are folks that were that were watching this on Facebook live. So they voted. This is a $1500 prize. The community award winner is Crossroads Pathways to Success Gerard Truesdale. Next, we have the Coaches Award. This is a $2,000 prize. The coaches selected Smell the Roses, McGuire Lubica. All right, next we've got two judges awards in a row, so we're going to start with the third place award. It was a $7,000 prize. It goes to Crossroads Pathways to Success, <laughs> Gerard Truesdale.
Yeah, they're letting you keep that one. That's, <laughs> that's the bigger one, right? That's the, yeah. The second judge's award, which was $12,000, goes to Scott Jones' Tiny Houses. And then you guys, you pick the $20,000 award, and y'all chose David Fricaro, Faith Action International. Once again, let's hear it for them all. They're all champions, you know that. Okay, I have to ask a question. Are, are, do they stay here with me, organizer? So we're gonna take a quick second too to recognize somebody that's not been recognized. Jody Rupel, come out here. They wanted you to come out. So Jody, Jody organized this entire event. Don't stand with me, I, you know, I'm out now. It's, you're with these guys. So a big hand for Jody, way to go. Great event. All right, as we wrap up, and y'all can stay right here with me. Before we wrap up, I wanna encourage you to donate directly to any of tonight's featured nonprofits or to the Future Fund Endowment itself. You can do so just by texting. So our screen isn't working. I'm gonna give you this number a few times. You can text GIVE to 336-310-0172. And then again, you would pick the number of the organization that you would like to donate to. So that was GIVE, text GIVE to 336-310-0172. We want to thank you all for joining us tonight. We hope you're in, you've enjoyed Future Fund 10 Live as much as we did. Please stick around for drinks, compliments of Natty Green's Brewery and Grove Winery and desserts from Crafted. And then make sure again to stop by the mezzanine where these guys are going to be hanging out so you can meet them, you can donate, you can hear more about their cause. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>